Let me introduce to you this giant cuttlefish, which is a Badger 288, one of the world's biggest rotor excavators. And this is how those machines work. They crawl, crawl on its wheel parallel to the quarry wall. Giant wheels with ladles scratch at rock and ground, leaving concave wall. And now, look at these photos and pay attention to the tiered structure of the quarries and mines. The rotor excavated tiered cuts are massive. It is a formed structure with right angles when viewed from above. And now I want to show you the mountains, ridges, gorges, canyons, cliffs in almost uninhabited ways. Often they are named by the people who discovered them. Are all academics and professors of geology and other science nerds too blind to see it? Mountain on the Kola Peninsula. I do not know the name. Mountains on Antarctica that were only discovered in 1820. Antarctica. Here are even the traces of the heavy machines and equipment. Greenland. Watkins Mountains. Look at the scale of the mining. Greenland. The flight from Frankfurt to Los Angeles. Gunbjorn. The highest mountain in Greenland, 3,700 meters. No problem. Almost completely gutted. Svalbard, Norway. Aurora Borealis in the background of quarry waste. Antarctica, Transarctic Mountains. At the foot, the traces of machines are still visible. Antarctica, Transarctic Mountains, Quarry Systems. Pay attention to the background. Mount Kalash, Tibet. The height is 6,638 meters. Have you ever seen in our time heavy mining equipment that's raised to such heights? Goblin Valley State Park, Utah, USA. Gloss Mountain State Park, Oklahoma, USA. Grand Canyon, Arizona, USA. It's just a giant quarry, waste, gutted territory. Millions of tourists think that they are looking at a miracle of the world because they were told so. Quarry, Grand Canyon, Arizona, USA. Nowhere can we find traces of water erosion only the shock explosive impacts on the silicon vegetation. Quarry Rock Spitzberg. Quarry Grand Canyon. The cut of the stone with a circular saw. Quarry in Australia. Blue Mountains. Blue Mountains from another angle. Blue Mountains. The vertical wall. Compare it with the marble quarry in the Alps. Marble mining in the apps. Giant quarry. Do not know where. This photo is offered as wallpaper on your desktop across the internet. Cap Rock Canyons State Park, Texas. Again, a national park created from exhausted quarry wastes in the USA. In some quarry wastes where there is a lot of moisture, people do farming. But now rice terraces. Again, Banal Rice Terraces. And this is Canyon de Chelly Nation Monument, USA. The saws apparently did tunneling. The so-called Painted Hills in Oregon. Mountains Ravine, South Africa. Orange River and Mountains. Timna National Park in Israel, just a quarry. Quarry Green Canyon in China. Flooded quarry, Charik Reservoir in Uzbekistan. Flooded quarry, another angle. 
and this is another so-called cave city of Crimea. And this is a modern quarry where limestone is mined. This photo is made before the revolution of 1917. You can see that from the limestone is accurately cut segments, the bottom of which runs the railway and where a house stands. And now a very important photo of Inkerman Quarry, the name Champagne, made in 1890. You can clearly see cut passageways through the hill, 100 meters in width and 80 meters high. Under the vertical wall, we can see small pieces of limestone and limestone crumb that fell off because of working saw machining. In the cut holes, we can clearly see houses. Some of these holes are beginning of catacombs, some of which extend for hundreds of kilometers. They conducted a large-scale underground mining of limestone. In the days of the Second World War, in the catacombs were hospitals, warehouses, headquarters, and trucks freely drove in and out of these catacombs. By the way, there are ancient catacombs in any city of the world. Near Odessa, there is a catacomb that is 2,500 kilometers long. Everything they tell us, rocks, canyons, ravines, cliffs, are just nothing more than quarry wastes. And there are very old quarries over there, and many fresh ones. This is a white rock in Belogorsk, near Crimea. It is a limestone quarry. The wall was formed as a result of the cut slope of the hill. Want to see more? Look at this passage from which a huge mass of limestone was taken. They lie to you. And guess what they call it? They call it the valley. A beautiful wonder of earth. Check this out. This is an old photo from the 19th century. The mound of the vertical walls of limestone chips are not yet overgrown with vegetation. This is an old painting from the year 1855. We can see ancient giant quarry wastes in the background. Are you impressed by the scale of mining in just little Crimea? I want to tell you more. There is no cubic meter of land probably 100 meters deep over the entire earth, which would not have been in its time mined, milled, masticated, and discarded. It is not a planet, but a giant quarry waste pit, where in the most violent and barbaric way, the entire periodic table of Mendelev is extracted. Our masters are literally devouring our home and turning into a desert and a scrapyard. Guess what? It appears there are quarries on our planet the size of several countries. For example, in Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, and Iran, there is almost no soil in these parts of the country because 100 meter layer of soil and all living things on it was removed. It looks like the Ural Sea and the Caspian Sea are just giant flooded quarries. Yes, yes, all areas in the world that is painted yellow on Google Maps are the bottom of quarry wastes. Uzgurt Plateau. In the middle of the picture is a group of cars. If you fill this quarry with a layer of water 1,500 meters high, you will get an analogy of the Sea of Azov. And this is the Sea as of Azov, flooded old quarry. The bottom is as smooth as a table on which rotor excavators rolled. The maximum depth is 15 meters. 
perhaps thorium was mined here. The edge of the Karakum Desert, the area of which is 350,000 kilometers squared. The impression is that planetary reapers worked here. In reality, Cory, for the rest of the population, Canyon Yangkala, the wonder of the world, in Turkmenistan. In reality, Cory, for the population, Plateau Tuzbear, Kazakhstan. USA Monument Valley, USA. Previously, this area was several hundred meters high, up to the stumps of the silicon trees in the background. Same Monument Valley, USA. Namibia, the desert is the bottom of a quarry. Egypt, the top layer is scraped out with soil and all living things on it, also burnt by nuclear blast. Most part of Australia is cut and scraped almost completely. No soil, only red desert left. Australia, Nigeria, desert. The conclusion is deserts are 100% artificial. They emerged as a result of long-term mining activities. Even more, you can easily re safely replace the words canyons, gorges, rocks, ravines, plateaus, mountain lake, and just simple lake in your vocabulary to the words quarry, mine, flooded quarry, flooded mine. Krivobor in Russia or in a different angle. In the middle of this island, overgrown with bushes, stood a rotary excavator, Krutevan in Switzerland, obviously the work of a rotary excavator, Siberia, Anabari Quarry. And now look at this. This is pile of waste rock in Donbass. The height sometimes reaches 300 meters. Inside them are chemical reactions. They burn and sometimes they even explode when they accumulate excess pressure and more. Let me introduce to you this pile of waste called Vesuvius in Italy. 1,281 meters high. But science nerds will tell you that this is a volcano because it is burning even once it exploded. What a story. How people buy into it is beyond me. And now let's look at the biggest pile of waste called terracons or volcanoes. On This is Terracon in Fujiyama in Japan. Geologists must be hypnotized in schools while they are students, because why else would they call quarry waste miracle of nature? Like, for example, this cliff in Australia. As you can see, there are no natural rocks, mountains, cliffs, and gorges on this planet. We are on a desert and a giant quarry that we are turning into a scrapyard. Ladies and gentlemen, no matter how strange things get here, they just get stranger. There is a national monument in Wyoming known as Devil's Tower. Now, this is a rock, a very old rock, and it is the only one of its massive size in the area surrounded by trees. At first glance, this looks like a mountain or just a large mass of rock left behind after erosion. Now, this wouldn't seem strange except for that this rock has a shape that is eerily similar to that of a tree stump. And if you think that's crazy, there are many more of these around the world. So the only question that remains if a structure like this is an ancient tree stump, 
then who the hell cut it down? Now, I would say since the last world war, we've been living in an age of revelation. What I mean is, the knowledge about the true world we live in is coming to light. Most of us would agree that the world millions of years ago, maybe even only thousands of years ago, was a very, very different place. And in order for this to make sense, we're going to have to go back pre-flood. Think about this. How bad of a place does the earth have to be in order for God to say, Nope, that's it. I'm wiping everything out and starting over from scratch. I mean, what did the angels and men do to this place? And their children, by God, the Nephilim? What do you think they did to this place while they were here? I can only assume that they terraformed our planet into a total wasteland. Now, I'm going to take you through some basic things so that I can build a case for what I'm about to present. First, what is soil? The Earth's soil is made up of unconsolidated minerals and organic matter mixed with water and gases, compost. It is the layer of skin on the Earth in which vegetation can grow. Are you with me so far? Don't worry, this will all make sense in a moment. Next, we have rock or stone. Now, there are three basic types of rock, igneous, sedimentary and metamorphic. Igneous rock is formed by the cooling of magma either within the earth or on the surface as volcanic rock. This can be formed from several minerals and makes up a great deal of the earth's crust. Sedimentary rock is basically settled minerals deposited as bedding after weathering and erosion. This is normally found in layers. And metamorphic rock is pre-existing rock that has been heated up in compressed, giving the rock new characteristics specific to certain minerals once it cools. Now that is rock basics, which brings us to sand, which is not soil, but granules of rock that have been broken down by the elements, becoming what we know as the deserts, riverbeds, and beaches of the world. So let's look at our deserts, and here's a question you probably never thought of before. Are all the deserts of the earth the product of nature? In other words, we know that these tiny grains of sand in the desert come from small rocks and finally larger rocks. But there seems to be more sand than large rocks, which gives the impression that the desert sand was not left behind by the elements or eroded rock, but dumped there. Now, when I say dumped, I mean that the desert sand is the result of a rapid breakdown. If you look at a geographical map of the world and took all of the continents and pieced them together as one mass of land, then you can see that the major deserts of the world line up to form one large massive desert. Where did this desert come from? Well, let's say that before it was a desert, it was lush green land that was hit by a meteor. And this meteor cracked the land mass into several continents, forming a crater filled with water that we know to be the Gulf of Mexico. The surrounding desert is nothing more than the aftermath of a great explosion from the meteor impacting Earth. This is one possibility, but it can't account for every desert in the world. So, another possibility is that this desert sand was physically dumped by ancient beings. What beings? We don't know, but I'm sure you can guess. You see, a quarry is an open pit or site where minerals, rock, stone, sand, gravel have been excavated or mined using heavy machinery. They are man-made. But what makes them significant is that the quarry walls have a strong resemblance to the mountain ranges and canyons on our planet. What if I told you that the Grand Canyon is not a natural land formation, but that it was dug out? It's just a long hole that was left after massive mining. Now, keep in mind that when you dig a hole, you have to put the dirt somewhere. Could it be that something like a volcano is nothing more than a large burning landfill? Or maybe deserts are nothing more than the dumping ground for quarry waste. Now, 
The reason I bring all of these things up, the soil, the rocks, the deserts, quarries, is to begin to paint a picture and show that the earth we live in is a deliberately terraformed, gigantic desert wasteland compared to when it started out. And also, that all the soil, compost, and desert sand around the world may be in great part the remains or debris of ancient giant trees. So now that we got all the science crap out the way, let's get into the good stuff. Now here's the theory, plain and simple. Around our planet, there are hundreds of land masses known as mesas. This is an isolated hill with a flat top and very steep sides. And some believe that these mesas are actually ancient giant tree stumps. Why do they believe this? Because they look like giant tree stumps. Now, that's not too hard to believe given the size of the sequoias in California. One in particular, General Sherman, over 2,700 years old with a 25-foot base and 275-foot height. It is one of the oldest living trees in the world. So, even if the oldest tree in the world is over 5,000 years old, then what happened to the older trees? These mazes look like the remains of trees that have been cut down, not to mention the mountains, which look like trees that have been broken off at their base. Now, if you look at something like Devil's Tower, we're talking about a tree that would have been over 19,000 feet tall, and the circumference of its base is a little over a mile long. So, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. If a giant or alien cut this tree down, what do they do with it? Where are the remains of the machinery or tools it took to cut such a massive tree down? And where's the rest of the tree? What do they use it for? Well, some believe that these gigantic trees were cut down, mined, and burned. So, the remains of those tree trunks and branches make up the rocks and stones we see today. And perhaps, the ice caps. Imagine what type of world it must have been when these trees were still alive. I mean, these mountains and mesas do look as if they were grown instead of molded over time. Take a look at the geometrical patterns formed in these rocks, the hexagon. These hexagonal patterns occur in nature and are found all over our planet as the cross-section fibers of these ancient stumps that are everywhere. Giant's Causeway in Ireland. Is this structure carved by the elements or grown by the earth? What about the salt flats of Bolivia? Now I'm not saying that this is the top of a giant tree stump, but again we have this geometric pattern throughout the flats as if someone had laid down tile. Look at Bell Rock in Arizona. Look at how these rocks line up as do the trees in the forest. Russia Ethiopia, Venezuela, Canada, Italy, Argentina, Australia, Cape Town, Africa, the US. It's not hard to find these tree stumps hidden in plain sight, folks, once you realize that this theory could be a possible reality. Folks, this is a true mystery that I don't know if I want to keep digging into, but I will. So, Consider this an introduction into a new area of research and get excited as this newfound knowledge brings us just a bit closer to the truth.
A powerful eruption took place in 1966 near the city of Donetsk, Ukraine. An estimated 33,000 cubic meters of molten lava buried an entire village along with its unsuspecting inhabitants alive. But the eruption was not from a volcano. And just a very short quote from a professor, a head of a national level university of geology. He said, A volcano eruption, in the most direct sense of the word. The scene around reminded me of the last days of Pompeii. The hill which erupted was not a volcano, it was a spoil tip which actually erupted. Out of the 580 spoil tips in the area, 114 have a molten core 
because of the chemical reactions which take place inside of these artificial mountains consisting of the waste product of the mining industry. And the spoil tips not only behave exactly like volcanoes, they also look exactly like volcanoes. So, in this documentary, I'm gonna propose to you a new angle, a new perspective from which to see various features of the landscape on Earth, which we automatically call natural, but in reality they may not be completely natural. At least in the sense that most people use the word natural in, meaning without conscious intelligent design or purpose. And just one small side note about the eruption in Donetsk that I just mentioned. Although it took place some half a century ago, it actually appeared in the news and in the newspapers very, very recently, when it was declassified as a secret information. Probably it was made secret to start with, just because they didn't want the people in the region and in general to know how dangerous actually the spoil tips can be. So amongst the various classifications of the volcanoes we have a type called cinder cone volcano. Many of the cinder cones are actually big regularly shaped piles of slag. Yes, that very same slag like the waste material of the mining industry. So how do we know that all cinder cones are real cinder cones? Maybe some of them are actually spoiled tips left from the previous advanced civilizations. Apparently the fact that some of them can erupt is not a proof that they are real volcanoes. Occasionally, on aerial images, we can observe stuff like this. Hills or piles of different composition. If they really popped up from the earth, from below, it would have been expected that they would have the same composition. So, later on, I'm gonna return to the topic of the suspicious-looking hills with few other types, but first I want to show you the images that impressed me most and convinced me that there could be some seed of truth in this hypothesis that many of the landscape features that we call natural are actually very, very ancient mines. This is in Argentina, of course. It's a natural park officially, as everything else. And this is the photograph that I found really, really informative. Just look at these long scratches, these lines. Maybe climbers' gear could have left such type of scratches? Do you think that's possible? I'm not sure that's even possible because look at the sheer scale of everything. This is giant. I don't know how could have human climbers left such very long and actually very thick marks. So I spent a really, really long time looking at these images and first of all I thought, well, maybe it is natural after all because this seems to be grown, cultivated stones. As you can see, these typical spikes, this is how it was uh, grown, farmed. For more details, see my previous videos on growing stones like living creatures. So first of all, I thought, yes, this could be a natural erosion because the softer feeling in between the spikes would erode first. But then if we look more carefully, we don't see harder 
cones which get exposed by the erosion, but we see actually round drills. Here you can see my point more clearly. This edge here is also very suspicious, as if some sort of a drill was uh, pushing the stone away. Was it melting it as it was drilling to form such an edge? And in addition, at this very site in Argentina, we have these high, flat walls. And this doesn't seem to follow the natural pattern by which this stone should erode. This is how this stone naturally erodes. It exposes the spikes. So the overall impression here is that this was an artificially cut wall at some point. And we have the same situation with modern mining. The wall is cut and below it there is a perfectly flat surface for the machinery to move on. So this national natural park may turn out to be a very very interesting place. If somebody from Argentina is watching, maybe they can uh, go and scout how is it and maybe send better images. This is at a different location and again shows the natural erosion pattern. The softer stuff between the stems of the mushrooms falls apart first, while the stems of the stone mushrooms remain stronger. And then the other image which really caught my attention was this one. I believe it's in America. So we have a perfectly flat wall which has eroded. Yeah, those holes on the sides, that's typical erosion by the elements. But how did this wall end up so smooth? And it doesn't seem to be just a small patch of it. Uh, both sides of the alleged canyon are precisely cut like this. Yes, this looks like natural erosion, but about this I'm really not sure. It's like polished and at places it's even darker, reaching even black, like Petra by the way. Again, we have a wall of darker color which seems to be cut before the fancy carvings. Again at Petra cutting very high walls. Again, with excellent precision. I'm gonna return to Petra later on in the video. There is so much material, it's sometimes difficult to structure the sequence of the presentation. So we are back at the American Canyon. I'm sure that the penguins already have a very entertaining story to tell us. How a river was cutting this canyon for millions of years. And it will sound very scientific because they will know all the millions of years with great precision. And with great authority will link it to other events which are equally imaginative. But the point is, rivers don't cut such precise walls, just perfectly vertical. And particularly suspicious I find those rivers which go across mountains, mountain ranges. How could they have cut through the mountain range? That would be a barrier for them to start with. I mean, how would they climb up there initially to start with their million years long erosion idea? But on the other hand, if a river finds a canyon which is already cut as a part of mining, yes, the river will be very happy to flow through it. And now these are images of actual quarries of our civilization. Decide for yourself if the American canyon that I just showed you is more similar to these images or more similar to riverbanks.
again. Notice where the lady is sitting. That cavity is really a product of the erosion caused by the elements. But the rest of the wall doesn't look like that at all. Now this is a bit of an interesting picture. Yes, the boulder on the back, that could have split naturally. Maybe. But what about this uh, cute round marks on the purple wall? That's kind of interesting, looks a bit like a tool mark. Now, what happens very often uh, during the so-called open cast mining, you put a monster in the middle and it tears up the earth around in a circle, pretty much like an amphitheater. Now, I would like to show you a few interesting amphitheaters from Antarctica. So, of course, every penguin will swear to death that this is completely natural, but I stared at this image very long time and certain questions started arising in my mind in relation to penguins and amphitheaters. Now, let's have a close look at this couple of amphitheaters here. So, officially, the winds were blowing, drops of water were falling and the ostriches were singing as well and all this accompanied by temperature fluctuations and so appeared an amphitheater in the solid rock. If it was only one and it was so regularly shaped, I could imagine it. But with so many of them and all of them so regular, I have difficulty imagining it. But let's assume it's true. But then I'm asking myself, why is this edge so sharp? Was it some sort of uh, micro winds, so to say? Was there a microclimate only inside at this particular spot where the amphitheater is? Cutting this amphitheater and the next one so precisely and when they met they formed this very sharp and precise edge. Is it even possible to have so tiny microclimates? such a small space so that you have local winds which blow with such precision at a precise angle and then a few meters away you have the next set of special winds which shape this sharp edge. No, it's not the winds. Nor is the specific uh, angle at which the sunlight falls on the rocks because all the amphitheaters around I see them having such precise edges at different angles. I don't know, snowfall, that also seems to be pretty much the same in the area that wouldn't form such sharp edges. The point I'm making is that the force or the thing which formed this amphitheater, amphitheaters really seemed to have been in the center and working with precision. If you can think of any force of the elements that could do that, please let me know on the forum, because I could not imagine uh, any scenario in which the so-called natural elements could produce such an effect. Whatever alleged erosion would have caused the amphitheaters themselves, at least should have smoothened that sharp edge. And two more images of the same region. Again, we have a clever river that cut vertical walls and then made a completely flat bed and yet another image at which I really really looked a long time. 
Now the author of the blog where I found it commented on it. Look, here we have even the tracks of the vehicles which were servicing the mine. I thought, wow, that's a bit brave to say. But if we look carefully, it may turn out to be true after all. First of all, if you notice, they kind of go down and then a little bit up in this area, maybe, maybe. Another point is that they start from the foot of the rock wall. Uh, they don't come from the right side where it seems the valley continues. And that would be the natural direction to follow if these were lines left by the flowing water from the melting ice. In addition, here they seem to really cross each other, which shouldn't have been the case if uh, these lines were left by water flow. So I agree that it is possible, maybe these are vehicle tracks indeed, but uh, not necessarily connected to mining, possibly connected to mining, but on the other hand, it seems that there is a lot going on in Antarctica, we don't know even what, so maybe vehicles are going to that slope for some other reason. Our modern vehicles, I mean. This is a modern excavator monster at work. Please note how the bedrock is cut at kind of a right angle. And then keep this in mind as you look at the next couple of images. And officially, of course, all this is natural. these modern mines, all they need is time and erosion and they can obtain the prestigious status of wonders of nature and become glamorously famous as their brothers in America. <laughs> So this future canyon is already working on its goal to become a famous natural wonder. And this quarry looks like as if it is almost completely ready to become a natural park. 
pay attention how does the coastal line here erode really from the natural elements. And now look at the other parts of this very same coastal line where we have the smooth, precisely cut edges. And now again look at these two actual quarries and decide for yourself how similar are they to the allegedly natural formations that you are gonna see. Now let's have a look at the various manners by which the mining industry disposes of its waste and then we are gonna switch to the topics of the European pyramids and Petra. So there is a whole lot of uh, very questionable hills on earth, like these ones from Yakutia, Siberia. They are hundreds of kilometers away from any road or any mining industry that we know of. They can have very regular shapes and their composition is of um, exactly that of the spoil tips, slag, that type of material. And they can be quite impressive in size, just compare with the conifers around them. So sometimes the mining waste is piled up as a volcano, but sometimes it, it is disposed of in the form of long lines. And maybe that's how a so-called natural formations like these lines came to existence. Of course, that's not the only possible explanation for this particular case. It could be also some sort of irrigation system, like we have something like this in Africa. Every case should be looked at separately. Yet sometimes they don't make lines, they don't make uh, cones, they just dump the waste like that on the ground. And after many years, those same dumps would look like these allegedly fully natural hills. And then those allegedly natural hills would look like this from close as if they are made of earth, but nothing grows on it. Well, the byproducts of mining are often very, very toxic, and no wonder that they can remain barren for a very long time. Yet another way of disposing of the waste material is to stack it in the form of flat hills. 
and if eventually some sort of vegetation manages to grow on them, this is what we have. A natural mountain, so-called natural mountain. There are so many table mountains on Earth, and many of them are suspiciously of a very precise shape. Again, this is from Yakutia, Siberia. Far away from any infrastructure, no question of uh, mining industry, at least by our civilization. And yet some of the mountain tops are clearly cut and the stones are of a very, very uniform size. And of course, the famous Nazca Plateau, some of the Mountains also appear to be cut quite precisely, by the way. And even if they are not made of slag, we have other options as well. This is a modern method of mining mountain top removal. Of course, I don't mean that the mountain tops of Nazca were removed exactly for mining. I just want to show in general that there were many other races before us and they were capable of cutting entire mountains with precision for whatever purpose, mining or maybe in the case of Nazca for landing or making some sort of uh, other installation and that most people don't have information what is it exactly for yet many others seem to know very well because in uh, china and in us we see modern installations plugged in to this type of earthworks so it seems we the ordinary folks are being used as a maintenance crew but the party which organizes all that on top level doesn't see a need to inform us what is the full project all about. So, of course, we have many different types of mining, and some of them give us a byproduct chalk, and this is how the hills look like. The hills of the byproducts of this uh, industry. And then we have the so called karst hills, which are classified as natural. This is what we get in the search results when we search for those hills. Well, what's the difference between them? The only difference is that the first group look somewhat newer and that we know of their origin. And about the second group, they look usually a bit somewhat eroded and that makes it easier for us to close our eyes uh, and feel comfortable with the fact that we don't know even who was mining the earth before us. Here somebody was complaining how they changed the statuses of the hills from natural to non-natural because if it is natural it will be protected but when they want to use it for something then they put another label. But basically they are all the same thing. A heap of chalk that has been piled up.
My previous video was about how a lot of the stone, the rock on earth, was grown, cultivated intentionally, pretty much the way we farm plants. These are some parallels between minerals, which are very well known to be growing, and a couple of species of cultivated rocks. Here is a micrograph or magnified image of the surface of a leaf of a plant. Again, the parallels are obvious. But although I have shown that uh, a lot or even most of the rock on earth was grown, cultivated, these are some examples of uh, grown stones. And the small ones are literally clustered around their mother. But despite that, it's possible that some of the stone spheres have a little bit of a different origin. Here our concretion is ready, after it ages enough, after it matures, it will be fit to be declared as wonder of nature and the tourists will take pictures of it in a nature reserve of the future. And yet another third possible explanation for some of the smaller concretions. These are so-called mystery artifacts found in uh, South Africa buried in geological layers, which the penguins assure us date from the times when we were monkeys. And very similar bowls are also found in Utah. So just compare them with their modern brothers, which are being used in this type of installations, machines, used again in the mining industry to crush rock. And now on the subject of caves. Look at this allegedly natural cave. And now look at this mine. Now as this mine gets abandoned in due course of time, the wooden beams will rot. And here is the result. Your natural cave will be ready for the tourists to admire the wonders of nature. And it's not just the entrance, the inside passages of many allegedly fully natural caves, when examined carefully, turn out to have elements which cannot be natural. In other words, a lot of what we call caves are nothing else but abandoned ancient mines.
Now find the difference between this mine called the Pudnevsky mine in Russia and the allegedly fully natural, of course, mountains of Sehret in Iran. This is yet another way to approach the problem with waste disposal in the mining industry and as a result entire solid hills are formed. This could have been one of the ways in which again so-called natural wonders have come to existence. The liquid waste material from mining is collected in tailing ponds. Now, it is entirely possible that some of the numerous salt lakes, salt flats, etc. on our earth formed naturally but yet, on the other hand, many of them look a little bit too suspicious not to consider the option that they could be ancient tailing ponds. Few other points make some of them even more suspicious, like, for example, spoil tips right next to them or in the middle of them, or the fact that many of them have perfectly flat bottom, which doesn't have a very natural feel to it. The tailing ponds tend to be shallow, even the modern ones, and tend to have very flat bottoms, just because they were uh, parts of mine themselves. When the given mine got exhausted, they turned into turned it into a tailing pond and started mining the areas around. Mm -hmm. 
And of course, as usual, now they are regarded as wonders of nature. They are part of nature reserves, national parks, and the numerous tourists are entertained by various speculative hypotheses, which all rotate around the same pivot. How could have this natural wonder come to existence? These hills in Iran of allegedly natural origin, of course, are a very good illustration because they show both features together, hills that look exactly like spoil tips, together with the saline sediments right in their foothill. Any other hypothesis which doesn't fit into the box of penguins evolving from monkeys is rejected by default. This is also a type of waste disposal of the mining industry. Now imagine you fill up this substance in some sort of rectangular shape or container. Won't you get this result? And now on the subject of underground mining. So, is it possible some of the mysterious sinkholes, the number of which seems to be increasing exponentially lately, are actually the remains of very ancient mining or mining by other races? The official explanation is often very unconvincing. The hole that you see on the diagram has a proper funnel shape which is the most natural thing to expect from a natural hole. In reality, we see something very, very different. Many of the sinkholes have remarkably smooth edges and form a perfect cylinder instead of having a shaggy-looking funnel shape. Moreover, the sinkholes are just the tip of the iceberg. Countless, remarkably regularly shaped and sometimes gigantic tunnels are found on all continents. And they are given all kinds of names and explanations, all meant to divert your attention and make them look as natural as possible. And luckily for those who actively work on obscuring our history, they are very easy to keep under the radar even of the alternative researchers because it's so easy to cut off the access to them. And here is some interesting information regarding these underground tunnels obtained during a past life regression session in the state of trance. The regressed person said, Although we have similarly looking underground tunnels, on various continents and they look alike, still each and every one should be looked at separately. Sometimes they would use melting, other times they would just drill 
and yet in other cases they would manifest it, translate it, so to say, from the subtle plane on the physical, kind of projecting it on the material plane. Some of them are entrances to the underground kingdoms, but calling them underground kingdoms is not so precise. It would be more correct to say that they are gates to other planes of existence. Down there, there is an entire grid, mesh, network of such tunnels. Some are also bunkers, ruins of mines, or simply a result of rock sampling. When they found what they needed, they would extract it, sometimes directly, to off-planet locations, or sometimes they would first take it to the surface where it would get processed. Then the regression guide asks for further details about this um, manifesting the tunnels directly from the ether or the subtle plane. Does this mean that the stone dissolves back in the ether? The patient replied that you can say so. Also, you can do it selectively. Just take whatever you want and leave the rest of the mass that you don't need. It's not that such a stone will actually really disappear. It will simply stop existing for people like us who cannot perceive the other frequencies. In the past, these tunnels were passages to other worlds. If one really needed it or was curious, one could pay a visit to the neighbors, so to say, and have a journey in the other worlds. That's how it was in the past and some tribes still keep the memory of these passages in their legends. But now, since the humanity got channeled into this more limited reality, such journeys are difficult or impossible. Certainly you can't go with your current physical body. Maybe some people can go with their subtle body, but even that is not very easy. They are guards and the access is very limited. And then the regression guide is asking if uh, they were able to, to create this type of tunnels exclusively using mental powers without any technical equipment. The patient replied, yes, they could and they can even now. A group of them would create a field of light. Then they would direct it as needed with their intention and the rock would dissolve, not even melt, but exactly dissolve, pretty much like paraffin. It wouldn't flow down like a liquid. And by the way, there is extremely valuable hint in this uh, regression session about the group of beings holding a field, creating a field with the power of their thoughts and intentions. And this is exactly the way we can deal with some serious problems that we face nowadays. Like, for example, the poison trails in the skies. If enough of people learn how to create and maintain the needed light fields, they could not only neutralize to some extent the effect of the poisons, but eventually even derail the full program of spraying. Influencing the material world around and the events that happen to us with the power of our thoughts, it's not as easy as some New Age cheap literature tells us, just wish and it will happen. No, it doesn't work that way. It is somewhat more complicated than that, but it is certainly within the scope with, of each and every ordinary person. It's not only for people born with special abilities. Anybody can learn, and the only requirement for it is to wish it strong enough. And now let's get back to mining. So what these big machines do is they strip a thick layer of the earth. Here they do it even on two levels at once. And what's left behind when they are done with their job 
is really a barren, stripped and perfectly flat patch of land. So, is it really a strange coincidence that we have similar natural, again, allegedly natural landscapes on almost every continent, Australia having probably the biggest chunk of it, and Africa is not far behind. How come they are stripped completely of soil and perfectly flat? We see that some sort of minimal vegetation does grow there after all. So for all these millions of years that they are always talking with great confidence in their penguin books, there should have been at least some sort of thin layer of soil. Where is it? Is it possible that these regions were devastated by such a large-scale mining, so to say? Of course it's possible. And waste products of such a large-scale mining could be maybe in Sahara. Why not? For more details, see the survivors episode on the artificial origin of Sahara. And if you think that it is a little bit too far-fetched to suggest that all the waste was transported to Sahara, just have a look at Mount Nimrud. Not only this pile consists of some sort of uh, pebbles that really look like an industrial waste, but also this pile happened to land at a very strategic place, covering a historic site in front of which there are very, very interesting statues, which suggest that the site itself might also be extremely interesting. And it's not just Nimrud, also the Nursuntipe that I've reviewed in previous videos, the Great Pyramid of Cholula, Tiwatiwakan, and so many others you can find in my videos and on the website. Always the same question, who put this pile on the top of the historic site? So we clearly have some party which is fond of piling up stuff on historic sites. So it is not so far-fetched to suggest that uh, this part as well buried on the sand what we call the ancient Egyptian civilization. The artificial passages at Petra, which are in no way different from the Via Cavas of Italy, for example, not only are amazing for their sheer scale, so the first question is who did it, but also why? I mean, the sheer height of it. Well, I think we are still far away from tackling who or why about Petra. But still, I want to show you a few new interesting things that I noticed about Petra. Now, uh, let's have a close look at the stone, which looks like as if it is molten. Let's see if it only really looks like, or that's what it is exactly. Now, first of all, pay attention here. Do you notice the cavity, the hollow space? And in front of it, there is a relatively thin stone of molten-like layer. 
Now the penguin explanation of this is that the rain was raining and raining and it eroded the hollow space inside but left the outer layer. Isn't it amazing? There is barely any rain in Petra which falls vertically down from the sky but at these cavities they have even rain and apparently abundance of it which rains horizontally to make those cavities. Now look here at the original layers of the stone. A reddish layer above, a whitish layer below. And now look at the molten layer on the top. Not only it is of a different color, and this color happens to be the mixture of the two original layers, but it also obviously and clearly has a volume, a shape of itself. It is not just a coloring of the stone as the prolific rains in the desert rain over there in Petra for the penguins to tell us stories but this really really was a molten stone at some point and now please compare the damages at Petra with the damages which a brick wall suffered during the Second World War due to explosion and subsequent fires. Now please compare the damages at Petra with these formations which are found in caves where rivers of molten lava were flowing. Eventually the lava would solidify and this is how it looks like when it does. And if you still have any doubts as of the origin of the damages on Petra, just look at this. Now look at the layers showing the original structure of the stone. Reddish, whitish, orange. Now look at the coloration of the brown and white river of stone which started flowing when it was melted. This is an absolutely mind-blowing photograph. Really, a river of stone caught in petrification as it was flowing. Now let's make some general conclusions about Petra based on what I previously knew, it's all in this video, and the things I recently found out, which includes also the farming, the cultivation of rocks. First of all, the bedrock of which the area consists might have been cultivated, grown, or at least the clearly orbicular patterns on the rock give such an impression. But on the other hand, we can't be sure because the destruction waves of the weapon or whatever tool or technique or approach was used to destroy Petra also tends to leave similar patterns on the stone surface that it damages. Again, remember that the brown and white river of molten stone here has the very same kind of orbicular patterns. It is also possible that initially Petra was a fully underground city and these tunnels with the burned smooth walls, they could be just an aftermath of the destruction. Like if somebody was uh, trying to destroy an underground city from above, and was directing some sort of weapon, it kind of made passages. And that's why we see, you can see that in the video, which um, I referred to before, that there are a lot of uh, remains of premises, rooms on the sides of such destroyed walls. And the passages are quite narrow. That means those rooms were situated exactly where there are passages now. And the destruction must have been carried on a really grand scale. Do you notice the 
poor remains of some sort of staircase here. So there are remains of staircase here, not because the people were crazy enough to build parts of a staircase in the middle of the road or in the middle of the desert, but because the entire structure to which the staircase were leading is now evaporated, missing, destroyed, molten down, disappeared. Here around, its spare parts are rolling in the dust. And of course, structures like the so-called treasury belong to a much more recent era. And so speaking of uh, rock cut passages, we are not in Petra or somewhere in Europe anymore. This is America. I couldn't believe it. Officially in Petra, they are called flood defense system. In Europe, the very same thing. It's called via cover or at other places, they don't call them anything. They just ignore them and exclude them from history and here in America they call them underground rivers wow 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 here they call them natural chain work of channels and that's on the home page at other places they are more honest and um, tell the story that this is a historical and archaeological site which was uh, sold to a businessman who made it into an aqua park. Apparently even the penguins sometimes have some um, sort of shame and uh, don't want to lie so much. That's maybe because uh, they evolved from uh, monkeys and the monkeys have some shame. So, most probably various races have been mining on Earth, but that is uh, far behind the horizon for the scope of the understanding of the modern man, who is not even clear and doesn't even care who is he himself, what to speak about inquiring into who are those others. But as far as mining and then smelting the ore within the historic time frame of what we call known history, that is the history that we think we know all about. Talking about that specific time frame, we were taught by those others how to smelt the ore and extract valuable elements from it. The proof that we have been exactly taught how to do it and we didn't discover it by ourselves you can find in these two videos. Some people also believe that some of the product of the mining was uh, exported off planet. Anything is possible, of course. I haven't seen such information coming from any reliable source, but it could be going on even now just by looking at the price tags of various substances. It appears certainly to be unrelated to the financial reward that the miners receive for their hard work. And combine all this with the fact that we have no clue what is going on in space. 
while the sheeple are being entertained with uh, fake computer-generated images about the so-called space missions, what is actually going on over there, we have no clue. They could be transporting stuff. This is a video of an alleged volcano allegedly erupting, caught on video. Decide for yourself, does it look like as if a stream of molten lava finally breaks through upwards, or does it look more like a simple explosion? Like the explosions of the spoil tips. The ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah in Israel. The balls of pure sulfur that rained from the skies and burned the cities to ashes are still to be found in the area even nowadays. Some of them are still seen embedded in the walls of the ancient buildings, while many others still cover the ground till nowadays forming a blanket. Just imagine what kind of quantity of pure silver must have rained from the skies? And with what kind of force did it uh, target the earth to be able to penetrate the walls of stone buildings? This fearsome weapon that turns everything living and non-living into ashes functions till nowadays. All it needs is to be ignited. It is even hard to imagine what kind of extreme, really hellish temperatures must have been reached for this stone to melt and start boiling. These kind of swirly patterns are by no means a natural formation. This boulder was simply exposed to such a monstrous heat that it turned liquid and boiled instantly. All living beings turned into ashes immediately, while the buildings are barely recognizable. Mm -hmm. 
remains of doors and windows. This is one of the best preserved uh, buildings. It's uh, got symmetric uh, four corner design with straight angles and uh, the sophisticated uh, shape of the outer walls is uh, symmetric on all sides. These are the remains of the city walls. These are the results of the chemical test done on the sulfur from Sodom and Gomorrah. This type of sulfur, the pure one, does not occur naturally, so we are definitely talking about some sort of weapon that uh, we know absolutely nothing about. And since this incident, this bombing has been so well described in the Bible, so well confirmed by the archaeological findings, probably the rest of the story is true as well, that this area was uh, with lush greenery and pleasant climate before this terrible thing happened. Interesting, how did the cities look like before they were destroyed? How did the residents look like? The reason for which everybody has heard about Sodom and Gomorrah and the reason for which people have been looking for their actual ruins is that these uh, cities are included in the current version of the Bible, the Gospels that are currently included in this Holy Scripture. Is it possible that in the Gospels that did not survive till our current times, there were much more details given about this Star Wars. Yes, I think exactly Star Wars is the most appropriate term for this because, let's uh, put it in plain words, somebody shooting artificially manufactured uh, weapon to the Earth from space, what else should we call it? It is not a secret that most of the Gospels that were in circulation when the Christianity was still a young movement, barely a religion, are simply not available to us. And it is more likely that the information in those Gospels is much more correct from historical point of view because the people lived much closer to the times when these events happened and in many cases even witnessed them. Nor it is a secret that the Gospels that did reach us did so in a heavily edited form. Various rulers through ages adjusted them to suit their political ends. Preserving the historical authenticity of the events didn't seem to have been a priority for the people editing the Bible. So is it possible that we know only a few separate events out of a full chain of Star Wars? No doubt, the expedition of Nikolai Subotin to Uzbekistan was indeed organized as an attempt to recover some of the lost history of the region. But all its members were surprised by what kind of piece exactly from the historic puzzle did they find. It was not what they expected. The target of the expedition were ancient fortresses officially some 2,500 to 3,000 years old, which are currently in a pretty bad condition officially due to weather erosion. When they arrived, they started noticing that they are located in a supposedly natural valley that has a suspiciously oval shape, it looks like a crater with 5 kilometers of diameter. 
The area was covered with countless pieces of black slag. It seems that for some unknown reason the top layer of the sand burned at some point. On the edge of this crater there are groups of fulgurite formations. The fulgurites are of really giant size for a fulgurite. The biggest of them would be usually 10-15 centimeters, while these ones are the size of a tree trunk. Fulgurites are formed when lightnings strike sand or stones. How big were the lightnings that struck this place? And as if this is not enough, there are tectites all over the place. It's a tectite? Petrographic and chemical characteristics of the tectites indicate that they were formed as a result of a rapid cooling from a high temperature at a melting point of above 2000 degrees Celsius, indicating catastrophic origins. Well, it really seems that something pretty dramatic happened here. Let's look a bit into the details to try to get further clues. First of all, at places the fortresses are covered with strange holes. They have a conus shape, as if somebody was repeatedly poking them with some sort of very sharp object. There is nothing stuck inside the holes. And there are not signs of erosion as well, because the holes are perfectly shaped and always of a uniform conus form. So the more one looks at them, the more the official version that they were destroyed only by the weathering seems to hold less and less water. Another point, here we see two fortresses next to each other. The smaller one is quite well preserved, although as if somebody cut it with a knife at a certain height, but the other one is missing altogether. The huge fortress behind is leveled to the ground. Only the walls are left. If the bigger one was destroyed by the elements and time, at least the building material should have been piled up over there, but everything is completely gone missing. While the other one, which is built of the absolutely same bricks, is uh, relatively very well preserved. Most likely these holes were inflicted, were caused by something, the closest word to which would be meteorite shower, because the objects hit the fortresses obviously with great force and they were parallel to each other if they were uh, objects at all they could have been some sort of energy as well and the second is even more likely because as we said there is nothing stuck in those holes and although the fortresses are made of uh, bricks they are not uh, as flimsy as they seem because the bricks by themselves uh, weigh some uh, 10 kilos each, they are that big and very very hard. They are somehow extremely hardened by time or because of their initial composition it's not uh, clear, but um, they seem misleadingly soft on the photos. People who have been actually there describe the walls as uh, very much hardened monoliths. And now let's return to the very interesting fulgurites. Although there could be occasionally some petrified trees, Amongst these uh, bunches of uh, groups of weird objects protruding out of the sand around the edge of this uh, five kilometer wide crater, still the majority of them could be described in simple words like something resembling pipes of uh, material similar to glass or metal. Not only their material is not that of a petrified trees, but also if you pay attention, these really don't look like trees. I mean, trees don't grow in this fashion. See here, two pipes grow separately and then they start growing together 
or here uh, trees don't grow in this way or in this way for example or in this way moreover this is this feels and sounds like metal when we hit it it's got the composition of a gigantic fulgurite here is uh, an official piece of information regarding fulgurites. Fulgurites are natural tubes or crusts of glass formed by the fusion of a silica quartz sand or a rock from a lightning strike. Their shape mimics the path of the lightning bolt as it disappears into the ground. All lightning strikes that hit the ground are capable of forming fulgurites. A temperature of 1800 degrees Celsius is required to instantaneously melt sand and form a fulgurite. Clarification: Most lightning strikes have a temperature of 2500 degrees Celsius. Fulgurites have been found worldwide, but are relatively rare. So, to get back to Uzbekistan, our fulgurites are very, very fat. Of course, everything is possible. There could be some natural processes that are not well studied. Maybe the people of the Electric Universe and the Thunderbolt project are making attempts to bring the truth about them to the society but they don't answer the question how come these strange things always happen near important uh, ancient sites most likely these were some sort of uh, weapons that uh, used uh, weather control or controlling what we call the forces of nature so basically at this point the boundary between natural and not starts becoming blurry and let's for a minute just uh, go to china and see the baigong pipes they are declared an absolute mystery well they really look like fulgurites to me just look at them Unfortunately, it's uh, hard or impossible to find proper information and much uh, photographs of the place. But in case the, I don't know, speculations or uh, facts that there are pyramids nearby, or at least one, with an entry that you can uh, see on these uh, photographs, if that's the case, then, well, yet one more confirmation that we know very, very little of what has been going on on our planet. We have uh, no clue what our history has been, what kind of energy have been used and by whom. Especially the Baikong pipes are considered mysterious because they are found in extremely ancient uh, layers of uh, many hundreds of thousands of years at least. And always the mystery is formulated in this way. Who manufactured these pipes hundreds of thousands of millions ago? Well, they look like pure fulgurites to me. Just look at the photograph. It doesn't mean that all fulgurites are naturally occurring, especially if uh, they are found near a pyramid. That uh, makes it very, very interesting. And now the tektites. Again, very similar scenario. How were they formed? Extremely hot burning material traveling with great velocity in space or in the air. They are found at uh, meteorite sites. But also at other craters like this one in Uzbekistan is a perfect example of a non-meteoric crater with tektites. There is an excellent article about them in the description, you can uh, read it. Also, Nikolai Sobotin mentions that they are sometimes found at the nuclear test sites. Well, one thing is sure, this uh, group of fortresses was destroyed in a really hot hell. They were not simply built by chance in a valley that uh, was a crater long before that. No, first of all, the top layer of the sand on them is burned. 
and the pieces of black slag still cover the valley. Second of all, the strange holes. And uh, third of all, the very destruction pattern of the fortresses doesn't uh, look like a natural erosion. How can a large fortress erode completely and there are no leftovers? For example, at the site called Ayaskala, there are two fortresses next to each other. One of them is very well preserved, while the other one is completely gone missing. Only the basis of some trenches or something has remained. Where are the erosion? leftovers. If it was a natural process, the eroded material should have been besides the fortress, besides the remains, but it is not. may not look like something very special at first sight, but this wouldn't be necessarily correct. Let's see one example of a fortress called Koelkrilgan Kala. This is how it looked like before the archaeological excavations began. This is uh, how the actual excavations proceeded in 1956. But apparently it wasn't to their liking, so they decided to bury it back. This is how it looks nowadays. Now this resembles very closely the fortresses found all over a full region of Russia. The most famous of them would be Arkaim. You can see when they start digging a very much industrial looking landscape emerges here, I would say not bad for something that is supposedly some 4,000 years old. Or at least that is the official dating of the site. Despite the obvious similarities uh, of design and uh, functionality as we, we are going to see uh, shortly, still the history textbooks continue to maintain that people were quite limited to their area at that time because simply they were very very primitive. And not only that, identical style settlements are found all the way in Turkey. For example, Nursun Tipe. Tipe simply means hill, that's why you will hear it very often. Also, Gebekli Tipe. Again, we have official dating here 4,000 years old. Wow, I don't know if that's true, but it certainly doesn't fit the rest of the stories they are telling us. Well, people were supposedly banging their heads with sticks only. At that time, all of a sudden, they came up with the idea to build this uh, industrial complex. By the way, only the crown part of it is um, half a kilometer wide. That means the basis must be one kilometer. This is enormous. And then we read the descriptions of the site. The walls were covered with plaster and murals. My god! And all we have left of this site are a couple of uh, photographs and uh, scarce information because the site itself is submerged under the waters of an artificially created dam. What a dam! Only a very small portion of the site was excavated before it got um, submerged in the waters why they didn't call archaeologists, I mean, why to submerge it to start with, and then if uh, they think it's unavoidable, why not call archaeologists to dig 
um, actively before it is submerged. Everybody who studies archaeology dreams of such opportunities for all their life and very few of them get it. They don't get the opportunities simply because the excuse for not allowing digging at many archaeological sites is their so-called protection. What kind of protection are they talking about if the full thing is gonna get trashed very soon completely under a dam? So we have these three groups of uh, settlements or um, groups of uh, fortresses in faraway countries, faraway regions, and not only their looks and shape are similar, most importantly they were all used for smelting ores that are rich in metals, mainly copper. This is not decisively proven in the case of all the fortresses in uh, Uzbekistan, but um, they are not very well studied anyway. I mean, what to speak of study, some of them are not even catalogued, means no name, no information. The group of Nikolai Subotin simply stumbled upon them when they arrived on the spot. And here emerges the connection to the topic that I have labeled as uh, forbidden metallurgy. I have uh, two long videos on this topic alone. Basically, the knowledge of uh, smelting ore was not discovered. It was uh, given in a ready-made form to these tribes. It is hard to say yet which party exact introduced this uh, knowledge amongst the relatively primitive people at that time because uh, different parties have been interacting with uh, the human race for uh, eternity pursuing their own ends some of them were to emancipate the culture and technology of the human race, others were simply using us as slaves, others simply killed us by fire from the skies. It would be interesting to see how the Uzbek fortresses would have looked like when um, they were in their prime time of use. Maybe something like this, although it belongs to a relatively more recent uh, period, some resemblance is there. It is again an Uzbek fortress. So traces of uh, colorful pigmentation was uh, found on the old eroded uh, fortresses. Were they as uh, colorful and picturesque as all of the other relatively more recent fortresses in the region? And how did the residents look like? Well, this is a traditional Uzbek lady.
Thank you.